Good, doesn't it? I saw as we as we progressed, you know, the kids they started shaking before we even started playing, right? <laughs> and you can see it move throughout the congregation. Saw a couple claps. PJ was back there moving. <laughs> it's a lot to smile about, amen. There's a, and this isn't a false happiness, right? There's a difference between happiness and joy. It is truly a joy to be in the house of the Lord, amen. Have a seat if you don't mind. Yeah, we're so joyous, just have a seat. <laughs> um, welcome. 
welcome. If you are a visitor, welcome to Temple Baptist Church. It's so great to have you here. Um, if you would, reach out to us. We want to know. We want to know that you're here. We want to know that you're interested. We want to know that you want to become a part of our family if you do. Um, and even if you don't or you're not sure yet, there's more than enough for you to get involved in. Um, uh, so please let us know. Reach out to us if you are a guest. Um, tithes and offerings. There is a, uh, a large bucket over here and a large bucket in the, in the foyer out there. Uh, please continue to give. God has been good to us. Um, and he do, he's doing at least uh, partially he's doing it through your giving and your tithing. So thank you for being faithful uh, and please continue to do so. Uh, if you are a member, you're, uh, today you should be getting, uh, receiving either from Scott or you've grabbed one or you, you got it by some other means. If you are a member, you should be receiving a, a card with six um, spots on it. And then down below there's another spot. Uh, we will be nominating today men um, to the office of deacon and we'll be nominating a trustee to carry out help to carry out some of the legal business as it relates to our church so if you are a member we will be collecting those by the end of service today please take those cards prayerfully consider six names of men that you see um, as god honoring and that meet the qualities of a deacon, put those in the box, either one of those, either one of those tithe boxes, and we'll collect those, and we'll begin to reach out as a deacon body uh, to those who would uh, faithfully serve as deacons this upcoming deacon term. Additionally, you'll see a name on there for trustee, um, and uh, we seek to to have uh, three trustees at any given time to help carry out the legal matters as it relates to our church. So please do that. Do it prayerfully. It matters. It makes sense. It's God-honoring. It's biblical. Um, so as you do that, do it in prayer. If you need one, keep trying to get a hold of Scott. Scott, one more right here. Trying to give him time. Let's stand. We're going to continue to worship. and Let's pray. Lord God, we seek to glorify you. You've called us into community, into fellowship with you. Lord, I pray that as we lift up our voices, we play these instruments, as we prepare our hearts to hear your message today, Lord, I pray that, that this act of worship, though small, though seemingly insignificant, Lord, we pray that it would glorify you. And that through it, you would be honored, and that through it, you would change us. We lift the, our voices up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
that one day we will see you face to face. Thank you, God, for that promise of resurrection. God, thank you for your resurrection. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Temple family. I am so excited that three weeks from this weekend is just going to be a historic moment uh, for Temple Baptist Church. You are going to be able to meet and welcome the pastoral candidate uh, that our pastor search team has uh, selected for us to consider. You see behind me on the screen uh, just a reminder of all of the activities that will happen on Saturday, August the 13th, and Sunday, August the 14th, that gives you an opportunity uh, to meet our candidate, uh, to hear his personal testimony, to meet his family and welcome them to the Fayetteville area, uh, to be able to go through some Q&A on Saturday morning if you have a question uh, that you would like to ask the candidate. Then on Sunday, he'll be here during the Sunday school hour, the Bible study hour, but will be preaching at the 11 a.m. worship service And you'll have an opportunity to hear him open God's word and to reflect on God's word and share God's word with you. So I want you to make a high priority on being present uh, for Sunday, August the 14th. I would would love for you to place a high priority on Saturday, August 13th, a chance for you to meet the candidate one-on-one conversation, uh, but certainly to be here on August the 14th. Now think with me. There are many decisions that are more historic and more impacting upon a congregation than the calling of a new pastor. Sometimes we, we have churches who buy property, relocate, they build a new building. Those are important decisions. Those are historic decisions. But the calling of a pastor, the calling of a shepherd, is just one of those momentous moments in the life of a congregation. And so Uh, You should move heaven and earth to try and adjust your schedule to be able to be here and to participate on Saturday and Sunday as you get a chance to meet our new candidate. We'll we'll continue to remind you of these activities, but I wanted to be sure and give you a, a reminder as you have time to adjust your calendar if you need to, to be here on August the 13th and August the 14th. Take your Bible in hand. Come with me to Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, chapter 7, you're going to need your copy of God's Word. Normally on Sunday morning, uh, we get to one passage of Scripture, and and we dig deep into that one passage of Scripture. Today, uh, we're going to be looking at multiple passages of Scripture as we examine the life of Abraham. And we begin in Hebrews, chapter 7. In a moment, we'll direct our attention to verse 4. October of 2014, my father, Leonard B. Register, Jr., went on to glory. A few days before his death, he had fallen in his home. When he fell, he bumped his head on the kitchen floor, and that that impact had created a a brain bleed for my dad. He had been in the hospital for several days, and, and I was sitting with dad on the evening that Jesus carried him home. Dad had been running a fever. He had been unconscious for a couple of days, unable to communicate, unable to, uh, to speak, obviously. This particular evening, my niece's pastor had come in to visit with me and, and to have a word of prayer with my father. It was an interesting moment because in those situations, I had always been the one giving the ministry, not the one receiving the ministry. My niece's pastor had beautiful words to share and to bring a moment of comfort and peace in my heart. He led in a beautiful prayer, and and as he said amen, I began to escort him out the room. As I closed the door and turned, I noticed on my dad's face there was a, a wince, 
it was the first time he had changed the expression on his face in, in 48 hours or more. I walked over to his bedside. I began to stroke his hair. Dad was running a pretty high temperature. I was trying to comfort him and speak loving words, compassion to my dad. I simply said to dad, Dad, if you're ready to go, it's okay. The three boys will always take care of mother. She'll never have a want or need that goes unfulfilled. If you're ready to go to heaven, it's okay to go. Ladies and gentlemen, I had no more finished that sentence than all of the monitors began to race towards zero. Pulse rate, heart rate, blood pressure. I knew what was happening. When all of those monitors hit zero, I stepped to the door, called over to the nurse's station, and simply said, I need a doctor. The doctor came in and confirmed what I already knew. He took his stethoscope. He listened for breath sounds. He checked Dad for a pulse. He pronounced Dad deceased. And then the doctor did something that was so, so tender. He turned to me and he said, was your father a religious man? I said, oh yes, Dad Dad was a follower of Jesus. He has a, been a deacon for decades at his congregation. He taught high school boys, excuse me, middle school boys in Sunday school. Mother, mother loves the Lord. She's been a, a children's worker in the preschool area for decades at our church, and, and, and I'm a Baptist preacher. He looked at me and he said, can I pray with you? And in that moment, the, the physician began to pray for me, for our family. When he said amen, he said, I'm going to leave you with your dad for a, a moment so you can have some privacy. He walked out of the room, and as the door closed, and I stood there looking at the earthly shell of my dad, the thought hit me. I was now the patriarch of my branch of the family tree. Until that moment, someone else had always been the patriarch, someone other than me. It was my grandfather when he was living. He was the patriarch of the family, the one that everyone in the family turned to for wisdom, for guidance, for direction. When he passed away, my dad became the patriarch of our family, and, and we would turn to dad and watch dad's life, and his life would impact the way we lived and the decisions that we made. But now, now I was the patriarch. And ladies and gentlemen, I've never had a more sobering thought in my life. It began to weigh heavy upon my heart. It began to weigh heavy upon my spirit that now I had the responsibility on my branch of the family tree to examine what does it mean to be a good biblical patriarch. You see on the screen before you this morning, this is my branch of the register tree. Guys, the next slide. You look closely, you can, you can see the guy who looks kind of pot-bellied from the broadside. That's, that's your interim pastor. Next to him, you recognize Charlene. And in that picture is, is my branch of the register family tree. There's our daughter who's standing behind me, Christina. You've heard me share illustrations about Christina. Toward the right of the screen, you see my son Chip. Uh, he's there with the beard, and he's holding Audrey, our number three grandchild. Next to Chip, his, his wife Amber. And then in the picture by Charlene and I, a little boy with glasses, Charlie, our number one grandchild. Next to him, a little redhead, Mary Margaret. And since this picture was taken, the tree has continued to blossom. We have little Gracie, who's 10 months of age. And as I began to think, and as I began to pray, I walked from Dad's hospital room saying, I don't know what it means, but I want to be a godly patriarch for those people in that picture. I want for the rest of my life, when they look to me for wisdom, 
when they look to me for guidance, when they look at my life that will have impact upon them, I want them to see a person who is godly in his demeanor. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I began a year-long study. What does it mean to be a godly patriarch? And this morning, what I want to do is to share two life traits of a godly patriarch with you, and next Sunday morning, to culminate this thought by sharing with you the last two life traits of a godly patriarch that I've been able to identify in Scripture. And they all flow from the life of a man named Abraham. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 4, look how the Bible refers to Abraham. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. Now when you get home today and you read Hebrews chapter 7 in its context, we're talking about the kingship, if you will, the priesthood, if you will, of Melchizedek and the fact that Abraham paid a tenth a tithe to Melchizedek. That's a sermon for a different day. What I need us to see is how the Bible speaks of Abraham in this passage of Scripture. Abraham is referred to as the patriarch. All throughout the Old Testament, when he's mentioned in the New Testament, Abraham is the patriarch. He's the patriarch of the children of Israel. The word patriarch that's used in this verse of Scripture comes from Two Greek words, if you will. The first, patria, means family. And the second, arco, means to rule. The one who rules the family. The one who gives wisdom to the family. The one who guides the family. The one who directs the family. So when we think of the children of Israel, God's chosen people, Abraham is the one who guides the family of Israel. And so his life this Sunday morning in his life next Sunday morning, give us some traits of what it means to be a godly patriarch for our family. If you're here this morning and you're a grandfather, would you stand to your feet for just a moment? You're a grandfather. Regardless of the age of your grandchildren, sir, I am speaking to you today. More than likely at your age in life, you're probably already the patriarch of your family. If not, it will soon happen. I'm speaking to you today. If you're here this morning and you're a grandmother, would you stand to your feet alongside of these men? Grandmothers, would you stand to your feet? This morning, I'm using the term patriarch, but I want you to understand that what we learn in Scripture today speaks to the role of a matriarch as well. Sometimes we men do not step to the forefront of our families and provide the godly guidance that we should. Ladies, when that happens, it's your turn. And so while I'll speak the word patriarch this morning and next Sunday, ladies, I want you to understand this applies to you as well. Please be seated, grandparents. I salute you. Now, if, if you're a mom or a dad, would you stand to your feet for just a moment? You're a mom or dad. We're reaching down to that next generation. You see, what we study today is future investment in your walk with the Lord. It is preparing you for a role that one day will be yours. My grandfather, Leonard B. Register Sr., passed from this life, and my dad, Leonard B. Register Jr., became our patriarch. When my dad passed away in October of 2014, I became the patriarch of my branch of the Register tree. But listen to me, Mom and Dad. One day, one day my life's going to be over on this earth. And my son, Chip, will become the patriarch of our family. He should prepare himself for that role. Mom and Dad, you should prepare yourself for that role. One day, our family will look to Chip for guidance and wisdom and direction. One day, Mom and Dad, your family is going to look to you. And the truth is, one day, one day Chip's not going to be on this earth either. And then Charlie, that, that little bi-speckled young man you saw in the picture a moment ago, will be the patriarch of our family. 
it's a generation to generation to generation responsibility. You can be seated, parents. And, and so this morning, while I'm talking about being a patriarch, I want us to know it applies to all of us. One day, all of us will step into the role of being the person that our family looks to for wisdom, guidance, direction, an example of how to live. And so let's learn from Abraham. The first thing I want you to see is that a godly patriarch has an intimate relationship with God. A, a godly patriarch enjoys an intimate relationship with God. Come with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. And in verse 8, the Bible is recording the words of our Lord, and the Lord says something very interesting about Abraham. Life trait number one, a patriarch enjoys an intimate relationship with God. Isaiah 41, verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. God, speaking of Abraham, God says, Abraham is my friend. The word friend that's used there in that verse of Scripture is a powerful word. It doesn't mean a surface, shallow relationship. I don't know about your life, but in mine, sometimes I refer to people as friends, and, and really, it's a very surface relationship. I, I know their name. Maybe I know what role they play within our organization at work. Maybe I know from from Facebook connection, what some of their hobbies happen to be, but it's really a, a shallow relationship. That's not the word used here. The word being used in this verse of Scripture, when God says Abraham is my friend, God chooses a word that speaks of a close, intimate, strong relationship. God says Abraham is my friend. God, Abraham it. it is a person who has a relationship with me. He's close to me. He's intimate with me. He has a strong relationship with me. It's as if God is saying, Abraham is, he's my best friend. Look how God says it. Descendant of Abraham, my friend. Not Abraham, one of my friends. Not Abraham, a friend. He says, Abraham is my friend. I, I want the world to know that this Abraham is close and intimate and has a strong relationship with me. God says, Abraham is my best friend. In today's parlance, we might say, Abraham was God's BFF, best friend forever. It's just this strong bond that God is pointing to in this verse of Scripture. And it's so strong, ladies and gentlemen, that other people in Abraham's life recognize this friendship. Come with me, if you will, to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Let's see how others in Scripture refer to this relationship between Abraham and God. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 5. We begin to peek into Jehoshaphat, who now is, is king of Judah. Verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, verse 6. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. Verse 7, here it is. Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. Not only does God say that, that Abraham is his strong best friend, his close, intimate friend, but there's such a relationship there that Jehoshaphat looks on to Abraham's life and is speaking to the Lord. He says, Abraham, your friend forever. Can I ask you to do something this morning? Can you think for just a moment about your best friend in all the world? Who's your best friend now? Now, men, I know you instinctively just whispered to your wife, you're my best friend. But other than your spouse, who's your best friend? 
Who's that person that you can always count on? Who's that person that always has your back? Who's that person that when life comes crashing down around you, you pick up the telephone and you dial their number? Because somehow you know that just hearing their voice and receiving their advice and having them pray for you is somehow going to take the worst situation in your life and make it a little better. Who's your best friend? That's the relationship between God and Abraham. And it's so strong and it's so powerful that others recognize this friendship with God in Abraham's life. And the question is, ladies and gentlemen, how do you do that? How do you have such a relationship with God that is so strong, so vibrant, so life-giving that God calls you my friend? I can't think of a greater accolade in all of life than for the creator God of heaven seated on his throne to look down and say, Chuck, you're my friend. I would rather hear God say that than to have anyone say, you're, you're the finest husband I've ever known. You're, you're the greatest father who's ever lived. You're the greatest preacher and Bible teacher that's ever graced a pulpit. I would rather hear God say, Chuck, you're my friend. It's the first life trait of a godly patriarch. I want my spouse to know that I'm a friend of God. I want my children to know that I'm a friend of God. I want my grandchildren to know that God calls me his friend. And the question is, how do you do that? How do you get there? How do you come to the place that your relationship with God is so strong and vibrant that God looks down from heaven and says, you're my friend? Ladies and gentlemen, I believe it's proximity over time builds intimacy. Proximity over time. Think about it. Think about your spouse. Years ago, you had your first date with your spouse. And on that first date, you got to know one another a little better, but there was not a degree of intimacy, not a degree of of personal connection, not a degree of being on the same mental plane, if you will, you, you were just enjoying one another's company. But one date led to a second date, and a second date led to a third date. And with each passing date, in togetherness, over time, proximity over time, you grew closer and closer and closer. So finally, you, you were intimate enough in your relationship that you said, we, we need to be husband and wife. We need to join our lives together. And, and you stood before a minister and and he pronounced you husband and wife, and, and you thought you were as intimate relationally as you could possibly be in that moment. And those of us who have been married 25, 30, and 40 years know you're just getting started. I read an article yesterday. I hope you'll look it up. I, I found it on Twitter. It's a Fox News article. This couple in Ohio celebrating their 100th anniversary, excuse me, their 100th birthday. Did anybody see that article? They've been married 79 years. 79 years. And the article talks about when they first met, and they met in church. See, that's where you meet a good spouse, in church. They met in church. Went to an ice cream parlor after that first revival service and began to talk and enjoyed having each other's company. And so the man started going back to the same church so he could see that pretty little girl. And proximity over time. They became more intimate, more intimate, more intimate, closer and closer. Their heart were wed more closely together, proximity over time. So how do you do that with God? You do it through the study of his word. You do it through prayer. How, how do you become intimate with God? How, how does this intimacy grow between you and the Lord? It grows as you devote yourself to the study of his word and as you spend time pouring your life and pouring your heart into his word. And as you speak to him in prayer, and he speaks to you in prayer, in, in the word and in prayer, proximity over time, this relationship grows. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm simply saying to you this morning is, being a godly patriarch, being a godly matriarch, it all starts in your relationship with God. Intimacy with God. That begins by surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
sir, ma'am. Intimacy with God begins by saying, you know, I've messed my life up. I've tried to direct my life and control my life and lead my life, and I've just made a mess of my life. And, and Lord, would you just forgive me for making a mess of my own life? And Jesus, would you come into my heart and take control? Would you be the Lord, the Master, the Savior, the King of my life? I surrender my life, as messy as it is, I surrender my life to you, Jesus. That's where intimacy begins. And then you lay on that, on top of that relationship, Bible study, prayer, Bible study, prayer, Bible study, prayer. The more time you spend with the Father, the closer you grow in your relationship. Abraham, he enjoyed an intimate relationship with God. The, the, second, the second one I want you to see, the second life trait, Found in Genesis chapter 12. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, we see this, this second life trait, faith in the Lord that activates obedience and culminates in worship. Now, let me say that again. It's a long sentence. Life trait number two of a godly patriarch, faith that activates obedience, faith that leads you to be obedient to the Lord, and that obedience culminates in worship. You see, ladies and gentlemen, to be a godly patriarch, it's not enough simply to be obedient to the Lord, though obedience is important. Where we have to move to is obedience that culminates in worship. Let me show you that in Abraham's life. Come with me. Genesis chapter 12. We'll begin with verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Now, now to understand exactly what God is saying in, in, the, in the King James or the NSAV, it's going to say Abram. We know that Abraham and Abraham and Abram are the same people. He formerly went by Abram. He later became Abraham, same man. Here's what God is saying. Abram in Genesis chapter 12 is a very wealthy individual. He's a very powerful and influential individual. And God says, listen, Abram, I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave your kinfolk. And I want you to leave your comfort zone. Look back at the verse. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives, your kinfolk, and from your father's house, that's his comfort zone, in his father's house, he's a very wealthy, influential, powerful individual. God is saying to Abram, I want you to leave your country and your family and your comfort behind. And look at the last phrase of verse 1. To the land which I will show you. He, he doesn't say to Abram, I want you to leave your country and your family and your comfort and go to destination A, he says, no, I just want you to start traveling. And as you travel, I will guide you. I will show you where I want you to go. Can you imagine the conversation when Abraham got home? Honey, we're packing up and we're moving. We need to pack up everything we own. We're going to leave our family. You're going to leave your mother and your, your siblings. We're going to leave our family. And Well, honey, where are we going? Well, God's going to show us. What do you mean God's going to show us? Well, God wants us to pack up and start moving. And, and as we start moving, as we start traveling, he's going to guide us to the place. I don't know where we're going, sweetheart. We're going wherever God's going to lead us. I believe that was an interesting discussion. Let's see what happens, verse 2. The Lord says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in all of the families of the earth will be blessed. And look what the Bible says in verse 4. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. 
He, he had faith in God. God says, I, I want you to pack up all of your possessions, leave your country, leave your family, leave your comfort zone, go to this place that I'm going to be in the process of showing you. And instead of asking questions, the Bible says, so Abram, Abram went forth. Obedience. No questioning, no arguing. Obedience. And I want you to see that this obedience culminates itself in worship. Come with me. Look with me, verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So what did Abram do? He built an altar there and to the Lord who appeared to him. So, so in verse 7, in the midst of his obedience, what Abram does is he builds an altar in order to worship the Lord. His faith activated his obedience. He, he followed the directions of the Lord. As difficult as they were, as confusing as they may have been, he was simply obedient. But that obedience found its way to worship. And that becomes the pattern of his life, ladies and gentlemen. Come back and look with me. Verse 8. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. There it is again. We, we see this unfolding in Abraham's life. He's obedient, but his obedience always leads him to a point of worship. Look with me, chapter 13. Let's see this pattern as it continues. Verse 3. He went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly, and there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Verse 18, Then Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, uh, which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. So we see this obedience, worship. Obedience, he travels a little further, he worships. Obedience, he travels even further in his journey. He worships. It's a pattern in his life. Listen, sir, you can't be a godly patriarch unless the people in your family see that when God speaks into your life, you're obedient, but your obedience eventually leads you to a moment of worship. Now, the greatest example of this principle is seen Genesis chapter 22, come with me there. Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, we see one of the mountaintop passages of Scripture about Abraham. Verse 22. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, I am here. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Now, how many sons did Abraham have at this point in the text? Biologically, he had two. He had Isaac, he had Ishmael. Ishmael that he had fathered through Hagar. But as God is speaking of this covenant commitment he had made to Abraham, in God's eyes, Abraham only has one son. And in the culture of the day, in Abraham's eyes, he only has one son, this son Isaac. And it's this son Isaac through whom God has promised to bless Abraham and, and to make Abraham a mighty and great nation. If God's promise to Abraham is going to be fulfilled, it's going to be fulfilled through Isaac. Isaac is not only his son, Isaac is Abraham's future. And so the Lord drills down. I want you to take your son. Abraham knew instinctively when God said, take your son. He knew instinctively who God was speaking of. But God goes on. Your, your only son. Don't forget, Abraham, your future is wrapped up in this young man. God is reminding him whom you love. Look what happens. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And go to the field of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. The 
What a command from God. Abraham, take your son. Your only son that you love with every ounce of your being. His name is Isaac. I want you to take your son. And I want you to offer him as a sacrifice unto me. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how you would have responded at this point in the story. Maybe you would have been just like Abraham, but I have to confess to you, I would have failed miserably. When I understood that God was asking me to sacrifice my son Chip as an offering unto the Lord, I would have begun by questioning God. Lord, I don't think you understand what you're asking. This is so contrary to your character. You're you're a God of love and compassion, but yet you're asking me to sacrifice my son. I would have begun to question God. If if that didn't work, I would have begun to bargain with God. Lord, not my son. Take take me. Let let me be an offering. I'll take my own life on the altar as a sacrifice to you, Lord. Take, Take, don't, not chip, take me. Ladies and gentlemen, if that hadn't have worked, I would have to be honest with you, I would have just lived in disobedience. It's as honest as I know how to be this morning. Slay my own son, take the life of my own son. I know my wicked heart enough to say I would have chosen total disobedience before the Lord. But not Abraham. Look what the Bible says, verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning. It must have been the longest night of his life. Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and offer him as a sacrifice unto me on the mountain that I'll show you. It must have been the longest night of his life. A, a sleepless night. An agonizing night. It is obedience, verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering, and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, it must have been the longest journey of his life. Can you imagine? Can you imagine traveling with your young son for three days and nights, and, and you know that eventually you're going to bind him and place him on an altar and you're going to take a knife and claim his life? Can you imagine the conversation that happened between that father and an inquisitive child as they traveled for three days? Abraham's heart has to be breaking. Abraham's... He has to be in agony. Verse 4, on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Neighbor Sam, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father, he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Stake through Abraham's heart. Dad, I, I see the fire. I see the wood, the knife. Dad, where's the lamb? Verse 8, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Ladies and gentlemen, can we doubt Abraham's obedience? He does exactly what God commands him to do. It doesn't make any sense to Abraham. It is contrary to every emotional fiber in Abraham's body. He loves his son, but he's being obedient to God. That's what godly patriarchs do. They live a life before their family 
So the family sees their faith activates obedience. And when God even asks the unthinkable, they're willing to be obedient. But I want you to see that obedience quickly turns to worship. Verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, I am here. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son he worshipped. We're talking about being a godly patriarch for our family. Number one, a godly patriarch enjoys an intimate relationship with God. Number two, a godly patriarch has a faith that, that activates obedience. Even when God seemingly asks the unthinkable, it activates the obedience, but it doesn't stop with obedience. It somehow finds its way worship. And that's what we see at the close of this story. Abraham, who was obediently ready to offer his son, comes to verse 13 where he offers a ram in worship to the Lord. Next week, we're going to look at life trait number three and life trait number four. We're going to see where those life traits bring Abraham in his life. But I just want to take us back where we've already been this morning. You can't begin to be a godly patriarch unless you enjoy an intimate relationship with God. So intimate that God calls you his friend, his best friend. And the first step toward being the best friend of God is for Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. There are some grandfathers here this morning that may very well need to ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior this morning. There are some grandmothers here. There are some fathers, mothers, future patriarchs in this room watching by way of television. And today what you need to do is just take one step toward being a friend of God by asking Jesus to come into your life to reign supreme as your Lord and Savior. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment. Every head bowed. In order to take that step toward the Lord through faith in Christ, you have to acknowledge your sinfulness. You've been leading your own life and you've made a mess of it. And you've said things and thought things and done things that have broken God's heart. Jesus died for you and this morning, you should confess your sin. Acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross for you and then ask him to come into your life. To forgive you of your sin, to become your Lord, Master, Savior, to direct your life. That's taking a step, the first step toward being a friend of God. I pray this morning, if you've never committed your life to Jesus, you would take that step today. If you would be willing in a moment as we stand in, in just a second, as the band begins to play and sing, I'll be standing here and I would love to pray with you and help you to verbalize to the Father your confession of sin. To verbalize to Jesus that you long for him to take control of your life. I would love to help you verbalize your heart in prayer. Maybe you're here and and you haven't been the patriarch, the matriarch that you need to be, and you want to come to this altar and just offer up a brief moment of prayer. Lord, help me in the days to come to be the patriarch and matriarch my family needs. Godly in every way. Maybe you're here, your church membership is somewhere else. You want to be a part of this church family on the, on the verge of welcoming a new pastor. You would come. We would, we would love to welcome you into our our family here at Temple. You respond to God as he speaks to your heart. Lord, take control of this moment. Speak and speak clearly. Help us to have the courage 
to follow your leadership. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're standing to our feet. You come as God speaks to your heart. be seated. We have a few announcements. So the first announcement that we have today is Vacation Bible School, and I do apologize. I have not given the times every time I have announced it in church, but it starts July 31st through August 3rd. It's a Sunday through Wednesday. It's in the evening from 530 to 830. 5.30 5.30 starts supper, have a little supper time over here, and then um, at 6.30 we'll start Vacation Bible School for the ushers. Six, I'm sorry, just kidding. See, I'm even getting it wrong there. Um, so tell all your friends, tell all your neighbors, tell all your people, and if you still want to volunteer, I'm sure, thank you, 
that you can do that. So there you go. Find Pastor Brian or um, anyone you can get your hands on, and we'll try to help you. Don't lay your hands on them. I mean, unless you want to pray for them, then that's fine. Um, okay. Uh, New Beginnings has uh, an event on August 11th at 6.30 p.m., and they will be in the Fellowship Hall for an ice cream social. Bring a topping to share, and the ice cream will be provided. And then the guest speaker is our very own Gary Dudley. So um, if you want to go to that New Beginnings, then you can contact Michelle Dudley. And, yeah, and then now we have uh, to talk about deacon nominations. All right, if you if you filled out your card, please place it in one of the two uh, generosity boxes, and we'll collect those. Um, uh, fill out. Fill it. We'd like for you to fill out every, uh, every blank on there, uh, but if not, even if you don't, if you are a member, fill out the card, put those deacon nominations in there, along with the trustee nominations, we'll collect those, and uh, uh, before too long, we will present to you uh, as a church um, those, those men uh, in order to be voted on and confirmed. Um, so please, please don't forget to do that, because um, we know that the Lord is working in the, in the men in calling leaders uh, into leadership here within our church. All right, let's stand. Lord God, we serve you, we dedicate ourselves to you. Let us not walk out of here unchanged. Let us not walk out of here unchallenged. Certainly as men and as leaders within our household, Lord, I pray that you would empower, equip, prod, poke, drag us along. Stop at nothing, Lord, to call us into closer fellowship with you so that we may lead in a godly way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.